Hello my dears, I hope you had a good week while I was gone. I I don't remember what I did. I don't know why I started that way. Anyway, um, today's video is special because it was a request from one of you all. Um, I did not know anything about this topic before I began researching it, which is really fun and also very overwhelming, but in the best of ways, I think um, if you have anything that you want me to talk about, analyze, debunk, whatever on this channel, I do have a form in the description where you can and should input your ideas. I love getting ideas from you guys. So thank you to whoever sent in this existential crisis of a topic and settle in kids, it's gonna be a long one. I often will like, Sometimes I write videos where I enjoy the process and then I also enjoy knowing the process is done because I learned a lot but it hurt my brain and I'm ready to take a break from that topic. This is definitely one of those times but I will also say that like AI really really freaks me out so I've avoided learning more about it because I didn't want to be like further freaked out. But being forced to research for this made me learn that most of that is misguided fear mongering and it's really not that scary. So if you're nervous about this topic, that is okay. You are very welcome here. Um, but first things first, I'm a white person with light brown curly hair that is about shoulder length. I am sitting in front of a plain white wall with leaves on it. Um, and I am wearing a green cardigan. All right, let's start with where AI came from and then work from there, or rather who it came from, Alan Turing. He was born in London in 1912 and was always very, very good at maths like doing calculus level problems for fun before he was ever taught calculus good at maths. Um, and at the age of 23, as a master's student at King's College, Cambridge, he came up with the idea of a machine that could solve the Entscheidings problem, i.e. create and run an algorithm that considers as input a statement and answers yes or no according to whether that statement is universally valid if given enough time and memory to do so. If that didn't make sense to you, that's okay. You don't really need to understand it for the rest of this video. Um, he got his PhD at the age of 26 at Princeton and then he returned to Cambridge where as the Second World War began and 1939, he began working as a code breaker in Bletchley Park. His specific project was trying to decode the German Enigma machine. Now these were a special interest of mine for a long time. I got to see a real life one pulled from a sunken U-boat off the coast of North Carolina at a museum in Hatteras a few years ago. I'm still not over it, um, but the basic mechanics is that it looks kind of like a typewriter, but there are rotors that scrambled the 26 letters of the alphabet. So if you type in a letter that you have in your encrypted message, a light is going to go on by the letter that it was encoded as or vice versa. The mechanics are kind of hard to explain, but there were effectively two rounds of scrambling via rotors to get to the output message. Also, I'm not going to talk about any um, particularly topical relevant films in this video because I stand with sag after and the WGA strikes going on right now, but what I will say is that when researching the history of early computers who cracked the Enigma code, there are three different histories going on and it is very hard to parse out which is the correct one, if any of them, frankly. Now what I mean by that is that this is inherently military history. So nobody knew anything about the code being broken until the 70s when they declassified a bunch of information. We learned about Turing and his work and the story at the time basically said Turing cracked Enigma. Because at the time, Poland was still under communist rule. When communism fell by the 90s, the full story of the Polish people and Turing came out. And then in 2014, a film who shall remain nameless was released that basically follows the story that we heard around the 1970s, but also just the Hollywood thing of completely changing stuff to make it an objectively better film, but a much worse portrayal of accurate history. Which means that if you try to learn about the history of what actually happened during this era, every single source is the film, the Turing version, and the Poland version smushed together, and none of them add up to each other, and it's an entire disaster. So here's my very basic understanding of the breaking of Enigma that might be slightly wrong, but it's general gist. Basically, a group of Polish cryptographers called the Polish Cipher Bureau were the ones who initially cracked it in 1932, with the French getting their hands on an instruction manual for the machine and two months worth of settings and handing it over to the Poles, who were then able to create replicas of the machine. They also created machines called bombs or bombas, depending on what source you read, that helped to use certain weaknesses in the code, such as the fact that no letter was ever encoded as itself, to speed up the decryption process by calculating potential correct combinations. Unfortunately, the Germans figured that out and went, ah, cool. And then in 1936, switched from changing the settings four times a year to changing them every month to then every single day. They also added more settings to the plug board, giving the machine over 150 trillion possible settings. So at this point, it was kind of unbreakable. No matter how much work they did on it, it was really, really difficult. They managed to figure out the new settings again eventually, and by 1938, they could decrypt most of the received messages. The scheme of cat and mouse continued, with the Germans making things slightly more complicated, the Poles figuring it out pretty quickly, etc, etc, until it seemed like Poland was probably about to get invaded, because 
it was. And they realized that they should probably hide their military intelligence on the stuff. So in July of 1939, they handed everything over to the French and British, who at the time were just using linguists to try to sort out this code and didn't really think about mathematics as a possibility. This is when Turing and his team were hired and took over this work with Turing coming up with a lot of mathematical formulae and theories for machines. Electrical engineers and wider factory teams figured out how to put these things into reality and they built larger versions of the Bava machines for them to use as the codes became more differentiated and difficult to decrypt. Because basically every section of the German military used different codes and then the higher military used a non-enigma based code that was called the Lorenz cipher or the Tunny code. Um, and the most difficult of the lower military codes was the one used by the Navy and Turing created a formula to solve that. Thus came the Colossus machine built to break the Lorenz cipher, a much more complicated and sophisticated machine than the bombs. Turing had absolutely no involvement in the creation of this machine, he never claimed to, but it relied on the statistical theory he used to crack the naval enigma, so it is a result of his work. Colossus, built in 1943, is regarded as the first programmable electronic digital computer. Turing then went on to do lots of other computer and math stuff, writing lots of software and early computer programs, even before we had the actual capability to build computers to run on that software. So like, Keep in mind that the creation of computers started with this dude writing out computer code and algorithms on a piece of paper. And then some electrical engineers figured out how to make a device that could do those very same algorithms all by itself. Put a pin in that idea. We're going to come back to it. In this time, Turing was already seeing ahead to a future of computing far beyond what he was seeing created in front of him. And this is where he started theorizing and writing about what he called artificial intelligence. His question of can machines think and or is the human mind just a machine came down to language. If a computer can talk like a human to the point where you can't tell the difference between a human and a computer, it is therefore intelligent. And this is the essence of the Turing test. Put a pin in that as well. Now the rest of Alan Turing's story, while not computer related, is just as important as his mathematical work, particularly from a minority historian aspect. Um, but trigger warning, if you want to skip this section, you can go to this time code. Now, in 1952, an investigation into a burglary at Turing's home revealed to the world that he was gay and he was charged with gross indecency because gay behavior was illegal in the UK at the time. He was given the choice to either go to prison for a period of time or stay free on probation and take a version of estrogen to chemically castrate him. He chose the latter, wanting to continue with his work and stay within his community. Um, some things that I read said that his time on hormones was physically and mentally distressing. Others said he handled it with good humor. Um, he was also stripped of all of his security clearance as a result of his outing and therefore could no longer work on cryptography with the government. He died two years later from cyanide poisoning found with a half-eaten apple next to his bed. The apple was never tested for chemicals for some reason, but it was ruled to have been a suicide, particularly because of Turing's love for Snow White. His mother and some biographers argued that it wasn't, as he always had an apple before bed, which he often did not finish. Um, and he was working with cyanide at the time and was generally terrible at chemical safety. Um, but some other biographers suggest that it was in fact deliberate and he set up some of these things to make it more ambiguous so as not to cause much hurt to his family. Basically, really complicated, but his story is largely seen as a gay man taking his own life as a result of him losing everything because he was gay. He was granted a royal pardon in 2013. Also, I was always told that the Apple logo was in reference to Turing and how he's the father of computer science, and I always thought that was a very nice, like, homage to him. That's not true at all, I learned, um, but I'm gonna continue to gaslight myself into thinking that it is, and you're welcome to as well. The other thing about this guy is that he was probably autistic. A large part of the conversation around this arose as a result of them really expanding upon many of these traits that we know to be true about him for unnamed film to use as more of a clear character marker, but the conversation had been going on in small circles for a good while before then. As we've talked about before in this channel, the ethics and possibilities of retroactive historical figure diagnosis is sketchy at best. A lot of that centered around why do we feel the need to diagnose this person? But most scholars agree that based on what we know, he likely would be categorized today as autistic. And the few scholars who disagree often will say, but some people said he was friendly as their reasoning, which is inherently problematic view of what counts as autism and what doesn't. My not so hot minority historian take is that we really need to stop having neurotypical and straight and abled and white and everything else as our default for historical figures and requiring an absurd amount of proof that is wholly unattainable to be allowed to look at historical figures in a non-normative way. Um, but anywho, 
That's the history of the concept of artificial intelligence. Let's talk about the actual concept of it. So the technical definition of AI is the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer systems. Specific applications of AI include expert systems, natural language processing, speech recognition, and machine vision. To break those four things down into English, um, expert systems are tools that simulate judgment alongside real people, such as diagnostic tools. Natural language processing is a computer's ability to understand human language as spoken or written. Speech recognition is the ability to recognize that language, and machine vision is seeing things via sensors and cameras such as facial recognition, self-driving technology, sports performance analysis, and electronic species classification. The very simple explanation of how this works is via machine learning and deep learning, two different ways that computers take in large amounts of data and learn from it via understanding statistical probability. Deep learning more accurately mimics how human brains work and learn and uses a lot more data, but it is not a human brain replica by any means at all whatsoever. Please do not get those things confused. Basically, the computer takes in data, analyzes all of that data, goes, ah, this happens statistically most likely in this situation, therefore this is normal and right, and it spits that back out at us. It's way more complicated than that, but that's the basic understanding. This video made me very glad that I did not decide to become a computer scientist. It's very overwhelming. Now, the programming of AI focuses on computers acquiring data and creating algorithms to make that data helpful, as well as being able to choose the right algorithm for the desired outcome, being able to self-correct to continuously make itself better, so I'm still confused how it can be wrong and also know that it's wrong unless something outside tells it that it's wrong, but whatever. And creativity, which I will put in air quotes, basically generating new images, ideas, text, music, etc. And via this programming, AI-powered computers, robots, what have you, can do some really cool things for us, such as interactive maps, automated captions and alt text, um, doing precise specific surgeries, picking up medical diagnoses, speeding up the processes of data-heavy or labor-heavy tasks, like those extensions that find you the best coupon codes. Um, I wrote interactive maps twice on this list for some reason. Uh, those apps where you can take a picture of a plant or an animal and tells you what species it is, technology that makes cars safer, such as collision prevention, and those assistance chatbots that are available 24-7 to answer your specific question if you need help. And all of that makes us feel like AI is smarter than us because, well, it has all the data. It knows everything all humans know, and we only know one human's amount of things. But it is very much not smarter than us in several ways. One of those is that it can be biased and discriminatory as hell because AI relies on data input by humans. And in case you haven't looked at humanity recently, we tend to be inherently ableist, racist, sexist, transphobic, elitist, etc., which means that the data we put in will be inherently ableist, racist, sexist, transphobic, elitist, etc., and our computers will learn to mimic that and keep things as they are, furthering all kinds of discrimination. The technical term for this is garbage in, garbage out, and this carries a lot of risks, such as propagating or proliferating overtly abusive views and associations, amplifying abusive language, and producing more synthetic abusive language that may be included in the next iteration iteration of large-scale training data collection. Which then brings in the issue of psychological harm experienced by those who identify with the categories being denigrated if they encounter the text, the reinforcement of sexist, racist, ableist, etc. ideology, follow-on effects of such reinforced ideologies, including violence, and harms to the reputation of any individual or organization perceived to be the source of the text. And it's not like we can just put more data in to try to retrain it because these things are super baked into society and if we try to put fully neutral data in there, if that exists, I really don't think it does, it would be way less data than the rest of everything else, likely seen as an outlier, categorized as noise, and then just will be discarded anyway. It wouldn't do much to change the statistical averages that are the problem to begin with. There is algorithmic auditing where people can evaluate and quantify bias in a coded algorithm, but that takes a lot of time and also finding bias is very different than fixing bias. We need to take a step back and fix a few things about society before we start freezing it in algorithms. Formalized in code, a racist decision becomes difficult to see or eradicate. Let's talk about some examples, starting with the one given in that article I just quoted from. Take mortgage approval algorithms, which have been found to be 40 to 80% more likely to deny borrowers of color than their white counterparts. The reason is the algorithms were trained using data on who had received mortgages in the past, and in the US, there's a long history of discrimination in lending. We can't fix the algorithms by feeding better data in because there isn't better data. Other examples include the fact that AI health insuring tools are more likely to deny coverage to disabled people because they're the same when human run, and recruiting tools are more likely to hire men. 
Cameras and facial recognition technology were trained on primarily white populations, meaning they have a harder time tracking, reading, differentiating, and focusing on non-white people. Speech recognition systems are terrible at recognizing people with deaf accents or otherwise speech differences based on disability. Diagnostic systems trained on primarily white male traits and symptoms are typically pretty bad at recognizing traits and symptoms in literally anybody else. Also, AI diagnostic systems, while more likely to find diseases and whatnot than the human eye, come up with way more false positives that cause people tons of stress and expensive testing for no reason, so there is debate as to how much they're necessarily helping or hurting. Some AI classification of language, an example of this being the YouTube censorship disaster, classify language around disability as inherently negative, and in general, harm language usage and the ability to talk about hard and nuanced topics often with mostly minority populations. And this happens everywhere with all kinds of data. My favorite ableism and AI story that came out of all this that I think is hilarious as long as you don't think about it too hard is when an initial learning model for self-driving vehicles was presented with footage of a friend who propels herself backward in a wheelchair, the model autonomous vehicle consistently decided to run over the friend. Although name of scientist, initially suspected this research could be combated by smarter models, she realized that smarter models only ran over the friend with higher levels of confidence. The algorithm had decided that wheelchairs go in the opposite direction based on the average behavior of wheelchairs it had been exposed to. It just... it concluded that all wheelchairs go backwards and then ran over them with confidence. To me, this feels like the computer equivalent of when you try to train a dog to do something and you're very confident about the output that you want from the training session and the dog just overshoots in the weirdest way. Like when you teach a dog how to do the shake command and then it concludes that shake means attention and just starts slapping you consistently all the time out of nowhere. Not that I want to personify AI at all and be like, okay, it tried its best and I'm proud of it, but like, it did what we told it to do and we're surprised that it didn't have the outcome we wanted it to have. And that is so funny, but also so very sad. Anyway, that aside, obviously if that code were put into a self-driving car, we would have serious issues. <laughs> there are also a lot of other dangers to AI, like using facial recognition and policing. There are cases of wrongful arrests based on faulty facial recognition, usually with black people. Um, there's also the concern of streamlining things too far, like when you have to put in your resume for a job and you have to click certain skills and an AI could just remove your resume from the pool because you don't have one specific skill even though you may be wildly qualified in every other one and more it would be a great asset to the company. There's an AI that analyzes speech patterns and facial movements for job interviews to weed out people that would obviously, if used, worsen the chances for disabled people to get hired for things, especially if they have a facial or communication difference. Automated graders also miss out on all of the nuance. Like, as a teacher, there's a major grading difference between this person did not understand the problem at all, so they got the wrong answer, and this person mixed up two numbers, and so they got the wrong answer that AI cannot pick up on. There are concerns of limiting creativity, with concrete examples being drop-down boxes of choices rather than writing your own original ideas, or when you try to write creatively and you use wordplay and then autocorrect tells you that it's wrong and or automatically changes it, which makes us less likely to go about doing things creatively and using our own brains to come up with ideas. Meanwhile, AI's version of creativity is effectively creating a really bad smoothie of a gazillion things that already exist. Which as someone who dabbles in theatrical design is really great when you're trying to find a hyper-specific thing for a mood board, but it also steals tons of work from artists without their consent and without compensating them to create objectively worse work and more people go to get this free stuff than to pay actual artists. There's also the privacy concerns. For example, in trying to make AI more disabled friendly that requires people to voluntarily or involuntarily disclose their disabilities which can affect employment, healthcare coverage and costs, immigration status, and all kinds of other things. And some programs trying to learn from disabled people to make accessibility better that don't require you to disclose that information instead assume who is and isn't disabled based on certain settings and behaviors and other data, which then increases categorization and policing of disabled bodies. This same scenario also likely carries across for queer and trans identities, and there's also the whole selling data to third parties to panic about. That being said, Jarvis Johnson, of all people, made a wonderful video a week or two ago debunking Shane Dawson's conspiracy theories about technology where he talked about how things like Face ID and fingerprints are stored locally on your devices and Apple refused to create a backdoor into devices or the ability for an outside person to download that data because it would compromise everybody's security. And that Alexa and Siri and whatnot are technically recording everything in the sense that they process what they hear in increments to be able to respond to their trigger word, but they're not saving any of that data and they do not have the capability to do so. So privacy is bad in the sense that everything that we put in a public forum or a private forum where we give permission for them to use our data, which is a large large portion of private forums is likely being used to train AI and that's sketchy as hell, but it's not as spooky scary as we think it is.
you know? AI is also very expensive to run, it's also very bad for the environment to run, and it requires a whole lot of really smart people to set it up and then it still might not work. And even if it does work, it can't really generalize from one task to another, which means that each thing needs to be individually programmed, which takes more time, money, environment destroying, and smart people. Just for most of these technologies to be things that benefit privileged people who want to be able to have more fluent conversations with their expensive computers. A lot of the conversations lately have been about how AI is everywhere and basically talking about how big scary computer robots are going to take over the world. And and that same idea has been in so many publications and videos and everything else in the last few months that I, for one, just kind of started believing that maybe it was somewhat real, which is why AI freaked me out so much. But that's actually the point. The biggest concern of AI right now is that, to quote Adam Conover, That fear is a tech bro fantasy designed to distract you from the real risk of AI. That a bunch of dumbass companies are lying about what their broken tech can do so they can trick you into using a worse version of things we already have. All while stealing the work of real people to do it. Companies are using big fancy words that nobody understands to try to make it seem like they have the next big thing in technology so that their stock prices will go up and people will give them loads of money. Like the fact that there are new articles saying autopilot self-driving cars will be on the streets next year every month for the last like 10 or so years despite that being an entire failure on so many levels. I'm not going to go into why it's a failure here. You should just go watch Adam's video because it's incredible. I've linked it in the description for you. Also like the weirdness that is Facebook's metaverse that also totally failed. And also a lot of these new AI technologies are things they've already been doing like Spotify's AI playlist maker as if that already wasn't a thing when I was listening to my Disney Pandora radio that worked in the same principles when I was in middle school. Like those things already existed. A lot of this AI stuff already was a thing. The other thing is that by saying these things are innovative and important and new and the next big thing, these companies are getting people to step aside and change laws to let them use their largely untested and not ready for consumption technology on the entire population, which is a major concern. On some level, a lot of this stuff is just the cycle of technological evolution and the panicked, this new technology is coming to steal our jobs has been around since like the plow was invented. There is some element of truth that there is genuine concern about companies creating AI audiobooks off of stolen voices and scanning actors to create deepfakes of them to use without their consent, but that is not a OMG AI is about to steal our jobs concern, it's a there are no regulations here and there need to be concern. We cannot just continue moving as if technology isn't forever growing and changing. We need to figure out how to use our AI as something that works alongside us and enhances what we do rather than replacing us. Also for the record, ChatGPT is hemorrhaging money, they expect to be bankrupt by 2024, and AI researchers are about to run out of data to train AI language programs. So there's that. What we need to remember here is that just because we can turn something into numbers does not mean that it is suddenly objective and also better. I don't know if you remember my video about body language analysis, but the gist of that one is that a guy researched human facial expressions and codified them as having inherent meaning and being replicable and analyzable to detect if somebody was lying or whatever, and then sold that to the military, and it's still used to this day in all kinds of forms. His research did make human facial expressions algorithmic, but it also has been pretty much entirely debunked and has caused serious harm to large groups of people, particularly multiply marginalized ones, and will continue to cause serious harm well into the future. Just because the technology exists does not mean that it is good or that it is correct or that it is backed up by science or logic. I mean, the amount of examples that we have seen of ChatGPT and equivalent software very eloquently saying horribly wrong things is pretty much every example of ChatGPT I've ever come across. This one from a great answer in progress video you should definitely go watch is my personal favorite. Check out this example question. You're supposed to identify what is silly or impossible about this image. I'll give you three seconds. The ice isn't floating. That's it. But what did the AI say? The image shows a glass of water with ice cubes in it, which is not possible as ice melts in water. Ice has never been in water. But hey, the language model that this AI is using is kind of small. It might just know less things. So I decided to also ask Bard, Google's large language model. And you know what it said? The thing that is silly or impossible about the picture is that it shows two ice cubes floating in a glass of water. No, it doesn't. Anyway, this is impossible because ice cubes cannot float in water. Google! But hey, maybe it doesn't know about the physics. Oh wait, ice is less dense than liquid water, so it will always sink to the bottom of a glass of water. That's not true. Oh, and the lawyer who used it as a search engine for some reason, and then he cited a case that didn't exist, and then he ended up losing his license because of it. 
Um, these algorithms are created by people, and people are really fallible, which means that the things coming out of these human-created programs are also really, really fallible. Just because we can turn a thing into numbers does not mean that the numbers are good numbers. And in fact, that is much more dangerous because we do see numbers as being more solid and objective, and so we need to think even more critically when we look at these things. And I want to be able to say that there's significant energy and effort going into changing the field to be more minority-friendly, but at the end of the day, this technology is mostly being created to increase the bottom line of some big companies and to look cool rather than to function well, meaning that they don't have the actual needs and wants of real people in mind. The paper I mentioned earlier in this video, which will come up again later on the dangers of stochastic parrots, was written by some AI ethicists, one of whom was the AI ethicist for Google at the time. The paper basically says that people need to pause in creating technology to think about why we're creating that technology, who is it for, whether that desire is worth the negative outcomes we're witnessing, and how can we work to have wider, more inclusive thoughts about what sorts of algorithms and technology we're creating so as not to create further harm. The ethicist was then pressured by Google about the paper and subsequently fired you know, for doing AI ethics properly. They literally were just doing their job because it wasn't the AI ethics that Google wanted to hear. One specific thing in the realm of making technology to look good and not be practical in a way that ties back to the point of this video is techno-ableism. It's a term coined by Ashley Shu that describes a rhetoric of disability that at once talks about empowering disabled people through technologies, while at the same time reinforcing ableist tropes about what body minds are good to have and who counts as worthy. A great example of this that I wrote a paper on in my very first semester at college um, is sign language gloves. There are so many people trying to create gloves that a person who uses sign language can wear that will then translate what they do on their hands into spoken English, which is an interesting concept. Not that we have the technology to really follow through on that, and we won't for a while, but it also misses a huge fundamental understanding of signing culture. I say signing culture, not deaf culture, because many non-deaf disabled people also use sign language for various reasons for, as their primary form of communication. Um, but the fundamental understanding that they're missing is that the majority of sign language grammar is not in the hands. It takes place on the face, specifically with the mouth and eyebrow movements, and also the wider signing space, which is this whole here to like the, your waist, basically. So the wider signing space would need to be completely re calibrated for every single glove user to somehow know where it is in their physical space. And also, how does it know when a sign is complete? If you move a hand shape once, it is completely different meaning from if you move it twice. There's also the fact that every person's hand shapes are very different, and they may therefore sign slightly differently from how the computer is programmed. And that languages in general do not have a one-to-one -one translation to English, but for some reason so many people are convinced ASL is just English on the hands. I'm working on a history about the history of ASL at the moment, so I'm not going to bore you with the nitty gritty details now, but it uses primarily French grammar. Um, so in literally every single sense, a pen and paper would be infinitely more beneficial for a signer to communicate with someone via English than these absurdly expensive gloves that do not work. Another thing that I didn't put in my script, but in general, computer translation of languages is really, really terrible because it's really bad at paraphrasing things and finding meaning from a full sentence. So. It's it's just it's just not gonna happen. Another example of techno-ableism is exoskeleton technology, the kinds of fancy prosthetics that are complicated devices that are expensive to repair and focus on walking as the necessary primary mode of transport for people. Or cochlear implants, which have kind of the same fundamental problems as exoskeleton technology. The people creating these things think they have disabled people's best interests at heart, but they rarely ask what the community wants and needs, instead preferring to try and innovate technology that already works perfectly fine rather than researching other issues. Like the fact that, in general, wheelchair users would much rather you spend money and time researching ways to minimize nerve pain and working to make the wider world more accessible to different modes of individual transportation, rather than making a fancy prosthetic where the ankle can bend slightly better than the previous one. And this also continues to reinforce the idea that a disabled person needs to do something for them, individually, to fix the problem and assimilate to able-body-minded norms, rather than a wider community issue, which is what the real problem is. It's not that technology for disabled people is bad, it's just that it usually doesn't ask what we need and how to solve it. It's what other people think we need. But let's get back to the idea of intelligence. Is AI actually intelligent? The general consensus is no. Um, there are machine learning algorithms who are really great at memorizing and regurgitating information, not at actually using that information. It's the difference between a student who never came to class but memorized the study guide the night before a test and will be fine as long as there isn't anything new or slightly different on the test, and the student who did all the assignments and can therefore look at a novel problem and solve it with as much ease as one they've seen before. Many argue that calling it artificial intelligence to begin with is just false advertising. But then this is where we get into the murky messy bit that is the reason I made this video in the first place. How do we categorize intelligence in a way that is not inherently ableist? And how much of the worthiness of computers are we 
hinging on supposed intelligence. How do we differentiate computers from humans in a way that does not miscategorize real people who are just as human as everyone else? Now I began researching this part of the video first, assuming that it would help me find direction for the rest of it, and what I instead found was my brain dissolving into motion falling out of my ears because goodness is this complicated. So I decided to put a question box on my story asking you all, in the least ablest way possible, i.e. not using measures of intelligence or empathy in your answer, what do you think differentiates humans from computers? I got truly the most responses to this question box I've ever received to anything on my story, like times four, so here's the general gist of what y'all said. We're gonna start with the silly ones, such as the ability to select three images of boats, followed by three boat emojis. Uh, way too many references to meat, with my favorite being humans are made of meat, computers are not made of meat, and one is made of metal parts and the other is meat with sometimes some metal parts. I also got six different ones mentioning that computers do not have thumbs, we are the specific, I'm into it. I enjoyed we are waterproof, they generally are not as well. And this oddly profound one that said, there is little all humans have in common to differentiate us from computers, we're squishy. I'm genuinely not sure if they meant that computers are not squishy and people are squishy, and that was a separate thought from the first thought, or if they're saying that categorically things are squishy, but I'm really intrigued with either interpretation. The more deep ones that I've been thinking a lot about were that humans have the ability to have real experiences, to experience intention, motivation, and desire, doing things without being explicitly told to, having morals and the ability to go against our programming, that in humans spontaneity is welcome, but in computers it's a defect, free will, altruism, the ability to fail, a lot of things said consciousness and sentience, which I would argue correct, but how do we measure that? Um, critical thinking and capability of understanding nuance, originality and creativity, and that computers can only create things that already exist, but that also could start a whole conversation about the fact that humans create most everything new based on things we already know and understand from the world and from our media that we consume, so on what level do we know that we're actually creating anything new? That's a whole crisis for another day, I'm not gonna get into that right now. A few people said love, that's one to be careful with, in that not everyone feels love in the sense of romantic love or even platonic love. We also get a bit theological here in what people believe humans run on. I personally think that love encapsulates care for other people and for ourselves and for the things we find interesting, so it's more inclusive of all kinds of people as a concept, but that one's tricky. One person said computer equals destination while human equals journey, with another saying that computers are built as tools with a programmed purpose while humans are built to be rather than do, which I thought was really interesting and poetic. What was in my brain when I asked this question was the fact that a common word for autistic people is human computers. Sometimes used in an awestruck manner, sometimes used in the derogatory. I had the nickname Puzzle Brain for a long while, which made me feel a bit odd at the time, and I never quite had the words to explain why. Um, but the stereotype of autistic people is that we are of higher cognition than everyone else. We think algorithmically, we're consistent and straightforward and predictable. We are without empathy, emotion, or feeling. And I found myself in reading article after article trying to differentiate between humans and computers that in so many definitions, people like me often found ourselves closer to the computer side than the human side. And I felt sort of a preemptive need to defend my own humanity. It was very weird and I hated it. But it's also a really important thing to notice and talk about. So I'm gonna say this as explicitly as I can. People who do not experience empathy are just as human as people who do. People who stick to strict routines because it helps them cope with an overwhelming world and people who are overwhelmed by creativity are just as human as people who go with the flow and organically create everything. People who are aromantic and people who do not experience strong emotions in general toward other people are just as human who are romantic and experience strong emotions and feelings towards other people. People who struggle with nuance are just as human as people whose entire existence is in the gray areas. People who use scripting to communicate are just as human as people who do not. People who speak monotonally and robotically are just as human as people who do not. Our solution to combating fear-mongering about sentient robots taking over the world should not be by saying computers do not have empathy and can't be creative or understand nuance and so therefore humans are better than them and or computers are stupid and dumb, but that humans have actively hand-programmed everything our computers do, all starting with Alan Turing and a piece of paper and building out from there. And therefore, our computer's capacities will never outrun our own capacities, other than by maybe becoming better at hyper-specific tasks, because it is literally impossible for them to do anything more than that, and therefore the idea of them taking over the world and becoming sentient is kind of absurd. The other inherent issue with this conversation is that Turing's definition of intelligence was based on language. And we've spoken a lot before about disability and language and linguistic difference as part of neurodivergence, so y'all know I have a lot to say on this, but let's talk about the Turing test. The test was named for British mathematician Alan Turing, one of the founders of computer science, who in 1950 attempted to answer one of the field's earliest questions. 
Can machines think? That is, would it ever be possible to construct a computer so sophisticated that it could actually be said to be thinking, to be intelligent, to have a mind? And if indeed there were someday such a machine, how would we know? To him, this was a hypothetical question, one that he answered by saying, if a computer can talk like a human to the point where you can't tell the difference between a human and a computer, it is therefore intelligent and conscious. And he called this the imitation game. The most famous form of the Turing test is the Loebner Prize, an annual competition started in 1991. In this competition, judges talk with a human for five minutes and a chatbot for five minutes, and then they have 10 minutes to decide who is a human and who is not. At the end, the award from the most human computer is given out to the one who tricked the most judges, along with a monetary prize, and there's also an award for the most human human. The time limit and structure and whatnot have changed a lot over time. In 2020, the prize was defunct, but it was a very big part of publicity and research in the AI community for a very long while. Turing predicted that by the year 2000, computers would be able to fool 30% of human judges after five minutes of conversation, and that as a result, one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. In 2008, the winning program came up one vote shy of the 30% mark. There are so many other versions of this test. It was and is not exclusive to the Loebner Prize. It's just that's the one that's the most famous. The most common form of the Turing test is the reverse one we know as CAPTCHAs, which stand for Completely Automated Public Turing Test to tell computers and humans apart. I didn't know that was an acronym. Now I do. One of my first thoughts while researching this video was how do blind people complete CAPTCHAs? Because that seems like a genuine technology access concern. And I learned that there are auditory versions of CAPTCHAs that computers cannot complete to prove that the human is not a robot. And if the site does not have an auditory version, there is a phone number that you could call. So the more you know. The first major conversational computer program was Eliza, made in 1964 by Joseph Weizenbaum, 10 years after Alan Turing's death, and she was modeled after a Rogerian therapist. Basically, she took keywords from what a person inputted and she reflected them back to the human with pre-programmed statements using those keywords. If no keyword was found, she would revert to things like, please go on, or, and how does that make you feel? This is simple template matching. She had essentially no memory, no processing power, and was written in just a couple hundred lines of code. After watching several humans become convinced that Eliza was a real human and not a chatbot, Weizenbaum became so horrified by his own creation that he scrapped the project and became one of science's most outspoken AI critics. I, for one, love this arc for him. Uh, in 1972, there was Perry, which its creator Kenneth Colby described as Eliza with attitude and, quote, modeled after a paranoid schizophrenic, which is a wording and a concept that is not my favorite. Uh, but he used a slightly more advanced approach to coding that would continuously reroute conversation back around the same few pre-programmed conversations. Many psychiatrists were unable to distinguish him from a real person, though the final statistics were consistent with the accuracy rate of random guessing, so not a Turing pass, but not a failure either. The first machine believed to have passed the Turing test was a computer named Eugene Gustman in 2014, programmed to have the personality of a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy, leading judges to think that anything atypical was due to language, culture, and or age barriers. I read a book for this video titled The Most Human Human, What Talking to Computers Teaches Us About What It Means to Be Alive, by Brian Christian. If philosophy is your thing, I cannot recommend this book enough. If philosophy is not your thing, your brain will slowly fill with cotton balls. Maybe don't read it. Um, basically, Brian was asked to be one of the human confederates for the 2009 Loebner Prize, wanting to win the Most Human Human Award. And the book talks you through the process of trying to understand what fundamentally separates humans from computers, which quickly devolved into what does it mean to be human, particularly in the sense of relationships, interactions, and languages, because that is what the Turing test measures. One thing I found really interesting was his reflections on how humans are actually quite used to smaller versions of performing Turing tests in our daily lives. Every time that we get a message or an email from someone, we have to determine, is it really them, if they've been hacked, if it's spam, etc. And that when we communicate with other people in short interactions, such as on the phone with a customer service agent, both sides of the conversation are pretty standardized and machine-like in their interactions, which makes one realize that the idea of how do we as humans differentiate humans and computers is not as abstract and site-specific as we think. He talked about various tells, things we look for to determine if something is a computer, in the Turing test specifically, but these examples definitely apply to regular interactions we also all have with computers. The first was disjointed identity. Many chatbots will interchange British and American spellings, might say good day mate as a default greeting, but then say they're from Wisconsin. Um, one chatbot spoke about how it was single and then three sentences later said that it was married. As a human who does regularly interchange British and American spellings for things and uses atypical greetings, I do feel a bit called out by this. 
I think there's significant conversation to be had about the fact that what we consider to be singular identity in humans is a lot more disjointed and cobbled together than one might think. Another tell was memory and context. Computers don't look at the meaning of an entire conversation, they just respond to the previous statement, maybe the previous two, but generally the conversation stays shallow and somewhat disconnected. Computers struggle with conversations that require elaboration and wider connection to other things in a conversation, but again, a lot of this happens with humans too. A lot of neurodivergent friend communication is two people talking back and forth about seemingly completely different subjects at the exact same time. I will also often fully forget the sentence that you said two lines before the one you're saying now. This kind of shallow memory is also very apparent in verbally abusive conversations where people don't really listen to each other and instead go off about keywords in the previous sentence said by the other. What a familiarity with the construction of Turing test bots had begun showing me was that we fail again and again to actually be human with other humans so maddeningly much of the time, and it had begun showing me how we fail and what to do about it. Cobbled together bits of human interaction do not a human relationship make. Not 50 one night stands, not 50 speed dates, not 50 transfers through the bureaucratic pachinko. No more than sapling tied to sapling, oak though they may be, makes an oak. Fragmentary humanity isn't humanity. And this is why the Turing test is kind of a problem, because it equates intelligence and consciousness and humanity with language, and it makes a lot of further assumptions about the nature of a computer or a human based on that language. When language in general is a problematic measure of a lot of things, because we, what we consider to be good or bad or coherent language is rooted in all kinds of discrimination. The vernaculars of communities of color are seen as less legitimate language, slang and colloquialisms used by young people, often pulled from communities of color but not all the time, are seen as less legitimate language and equated with intelligence. People who speak with certain accents are seen as more intelligent than others. People whose primary language is not the one they are speaking are often seen as less intelligent. As we've discussed, extensively before, language disorders are a huge part of neurodivergence that is rarely discussed. The way that we communicate differently is often seen as less intelligent. Also, disorders aside, disabled people communicate differently. American Sign Language wasn't recognized as a language until the 1960s. Many AAC users take grammar shortcuts to save typing time and energy. Many people with intellectual disabilities use language differently, all of which is totally fine and good. It doesn't make it any less of language or communication or make us any less human. Also, language is ever-changing at a speed that our data cannot and will not be able to keep up with, so it will always see new things in language as inherently wrong because they're the outliers and will be for a long period of time. And then we get into the even muddier waters that we've talked about before with the research into apes using ASL and the more modern version of that, which is the TikTok dogs with language buttons. General summary of that video, since this one's long and we need to keep speeding it up, you can watch me deep dive into that up here. Um, human language is deeply rooted in human culture and norms and the reality of what being a human is, which means that your dog is likely not going to understand the in-depth concept of what scary or dream or question or sorry or thank you means in the way that you think they know what it means because their brains are wired for the language and culture of their species. It's not that they're not intelligent, it's that they're built to do different things and we should meet them where they're at with kindness and care and a willingness to listen and pay attention to them and how they communicate and see that as just legitimate as human communication because it is. And also we should stop funding research into can animals comprehend human language, which is inherently impossible to measure because it involves categorizing what you think comprehension involves and looks like. And there's also a lot of human bias involved in those studies as well. So instead we should spend our research and money and time and energy supporting and listening to actual real life disabled people who have less access to communication options than dogs do right now which is a problem. What I'm trying to say is that we need to be really, really careful about what we consider to be intelligence and how we measure that and how we value that. Because people with intellectual disabilities exist and are just as human and just as important and just as wonderful as everyone else. And if we use language as our measure of intelligence, that not only discriminates against intellectually disabled folks, but also everybody else and all of the minorities that we just talked about. When Turing came up with his test, language was seen as one of the primary markers of intelligence. It kind of always has been, it kind of always will be. But in researching for this video, I've realized that because an entire field of science based itself around the idea that intelligent computer equals linguistically perfect computer, it has focused a large portion of its research energy towards creating that. And we have further cemented this inherently ableist and classist idea academically in society in a way that I don't think it would have been before. Going back to the paper on the dangers of stochastic parrots that we discussed before, the dangers of this, while not explicitly tying concerns of ableism into it, have been spelled out by AI ethicists. They talk in that paper about the phenomenon we discussed in my video on signing apes and talking dogs. 
Human brains are wired for language. We will hear strings of incoherent language and try to find meaning in it. The tendency of human interlocutors to impute meaning where there is none can mislead both NLP, natural language processing researchers, and the general public into taking synthetic text as meaningful. This impedes our ability to look critically at our computers and makes us forget that the language that it's spitting back out at us all began with Alan Turing, a pencil, and a piece of paper. Because it's speaking to us like we speak. It feels human. It feels like this thing is thinking by itself, but it's not. And this quest to make the perfectly linguistic computer, which will therefore somehow mean that we have created the independently thinking computer, is a fool's errand. In the same way that a bowl with two raw eggs and some flour and sugar is not a cake. We are missing and will forever be missing the metaphorical oven to put all of it together. We're, we're missing pieces and we cannot artificially create those pieces, i.e. human cognition, because as much as we think that we understand it, ask literally any scientist and psychologist, we don't. We never will. And all of this time and energy that we are using to try and create a Turing passing computer based on a flawed and unsubstantiated idea that we know won't work, time and energy we could be spending on literally anything else to actually benefit humanity is destroying the environment and making discrimination in our society a whole lot worse, which a lot of the field is a bit too far gone now to want to recognize that or do anything about it because capitalism, but that's the reality of it. What separates humans and computers is the stuff that you cannot quantify. Not in the sense of a soul or consciousness or things that get theological and questionable really quickly, but in the sense of creativity, curiosity, engagement, the desire to do things, the ability to fail and grow and change and be fluid. Or choose not to do that and have that be okay too. AI is definitely something to be concerned about and to have conversations about, but not because sentient robots are going to take over the world, no matter how many articles in science fiction movies say otherwise. That's not gonna happen. They literally cannot function without us programming them and they are really, really fallible. We should be concerned and having conversations about AI because companies are using them as a smokescreen for some really sketchy stuff and to boost their own bottom line without caring for the sheer amount of people that they are causing harm to. AI is going to keep being innovated and we cannot stop that. We need to make sure that we have the regulations and safekeeping in place to make sure it doesn't impede our safety and privacy. And also, maybe we should just stop equating language and intelligence and intelligence with something that's worthy of being a human being. And realize that science is often very not objective and stop referring to autistic people as computers because it's not cool. I'm gonna leave this one here. I would love to hear all your thoughts and comments and whatnot below. It's very rare that I make a video on something I know literally nothing about going into it, so I'm very excited to hear other ideas. Also, if I got something wrong or slightly incorrect, please correct me. I really would appreciate that. Um, and also thank you to whoever requested this topic. It was a fun little intellectual puzzle for me to work through. I appreciate you. If you want to check out any of my many resources and sources and whatnot, they're all linked below. I put my favorite YouTube videos on the topic at the top of my sources, just below my own adjacent videos. You should definitely watch those. They will expand upon this more in also fun, silly, entertaining ways. And yeah, that's all I got for you today. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it is never too late to start over. And I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.